There's said to be an old art dealer in Canton when someone said to him, uh, is this painting that you're selling me any good? The dealer would look at him rather quizzically and then simply say, my friend, open the door. That was the only answer he ever would give. In other words, in attempting to determine value, we have to open the door inside of ourselves. There has to be some way by which we are able uh, to establish value apart from tradition and apart from the simple testimony of our common judgment. There has to be a certain intuiting process go on when we attempt to determine rightness, truth, reality, and fact. Now, there are some facts that are so obvious that through general and common acceptance we are in agreement about them. But even in the world of facts, there are many rather elusive truths that cannot be quickly and easily discovered. To find these, we must learn to use gradually a certain extrasensory band of faculties and powers. The search for value, then, does sharpen our intuition. It makes us more observant of small things. It makes us more aware of those trifles which together make perfection. This power of deeper discernment is not limited uh, to trading in fine arts. It becomes a very useful tool in every phase of daily living. If we are able to instinctively and intuitively grasp value, it will help us wherever we must decide as to the merit of anything. Some people are interested in trying to determine the value of a religion. Others in, may be concerned with the value of an art or a science, or still a piece of merchandise, or an investment, or the value of an affection or a friendship. All of these values are essentially intangibles. And most values that we, we know today are subject to imposture. Things are not always what they appear to be. Persons are not what they claim to be. And unless we have some judgment, intuitive in ourselves, our lives are likely to be filled with disillusionments and disappointments and discouragements. The only protection that we have against being imposed upon in one way or another is our own ability to evaluate. Therefore, we must learn not only to recognize value, but we must learn to take hold of it, uh, to grasp at it when the emergency or situation arises in which decision must be made. In the Zen story, the little boy first sees the mysterious black ox that is the symbol to a measure of his search for reality. Having found the ox, he must next capture the ox. He must take hold of it and bridle it. And in the same way, in our search for value, when we have discovered it, we must make the decision which this value indicates to be necessary. In our world of, of material experiences, we are all required to pay for value. In some way, value is expensive. And the more valuable, the more likely we must pay well for that which we desire. Consequently, it becomes important to know when to save and when to spend. When it is wise to perhaps overinvest, and again, when it is wise not to invest at all. Thus, judgment 
is closely associated with the whole fact of value. Most persons who have been interested in art, culture, and related fields over the period of years have had adventures with their own personal weakness, as this has bearing upon value. Indecision comes in very frequently. And in indecision, uh, we are likely to lose that which is valuable or to settle for something else which is less valuable. So prudence, thoughtfulness, decision, uh, these problems are ever present where value is a factor in a transaction. In one simple way, for example, decision in life. If it is in terms of true value, helps us to avoid the innumerable pitfalls resulting from indecision. There are folks simply cannot make up their minds. Uh, they know what they would like, but they never quite have the courage to come to a clear decision on a matter of importance. This decision may involve business or family or friends. But still, this decision is lacking. There is a hesitancy. Sometimes this hesitancy arises from an instinctive sense of inability. The person who does not know may hesitate to make a decision in an area where he recognizes that his knowledge is inadequate. Yet in the field of art again, for example, all men's knowledge is inadequate. There is no one who has ever been an expert in art or archaeological research who has been actually able to say that he could certainly be right. There is always indecision where facts are not available. And in most matters of importance and value, all facts are not available. So we must make decision upon some ground. We must decide about whether we will buy or sell that piece of property. We must decide on what we will invest, or whether it is good to change employment at this time. All these decisions must be made. And research with value helps us to make decision. And decision in its own turn is a clarifier. Even a wrong decision can be more valuable than a weak indecision. In a wrong decision, we face facts, or facts become obvious to us. When we attempt to evade decision, we evade facts. We learn nothing. We advance no cause, and we leave ourselves as weak as before. On the other hand, we cannot afford to make too many bad decisions, nor can we be deceived too often without perhaps exhausting our resources. Consequently, the importance of value again asserts itself. The great Lavata, the wonderful old early 19th century physiognomist, became a great expert in the analysis of human character. He took all of the instincts that an art dealer will turn to art and applied them to the strange artistry of the human face. In the face, he sought value and he judged persons according to the values which he found. He learned that there is nothing uh, that is a quicker way to be deceived than to accept people by what they say about themselves. Nor can we often depend upon their credentials. Uh, we have to judge credentials by someone else's opinion of a person. Actually, we have to know something ourselves. To know this, we must observe, compare, weigh, and intuit. These are the only courses by which we can escape a simple mediocrity of decision which may lead nowhere. So from the discovery of certain abstract value in art, we search value in something else. And we search for it by becoming aware of the true meaning of things. We have to build up some knowledge, but knowledge again can play us false if we do nothing with it. There are many persons whose knowledge in an area is extensive, but this knowledge has never passed from a theoretical to a practical level. 
The individual has never tested his knowledge. He has never believed sufficiently in it to really feel that he can depend upon it in an emergency. Now, when uh, an art critic or an art lover examines a piece of Chinese porcelain, one of the first things he will do is very quietly turn it over and look at the bottom. Now, he does this because after he owns it or where it stands in the store, this is the part that is never shown. Now, from this uh, part of the vase, he learns something. But he doesn't always learn what he is supposed to learn or what others think he is going to learn. Nearly all fine Chinese ceramics are signed. The signature is most likely to be on the bottom, the outside of the bottom of the piece. So naturally, turning it over, it is possible to see the signature or the seal or some other mark which identifies a potter or a kiln. Of course, uh, unfortunately, there is nothing easier in the world to fabricate than a seal. Anywhere in the Orient, you can buy an excellent one for 50 cents and have it inscribed with anything you want on it. It would be just about equal, and I've seen things just about as strange, for a modern person to go in and have a seal made with a signature of Leonardo da Vinci on it. Now, if Leonardo had used a seal, it could be duplicated today without the slightest difficulty. Yet the seal is a very important thing in Asiatic life. A man's signature is meaningless, but his seal is terribly important. And the only substitute for it is his thumbprint. That will be acceptable. But an individual who very carefully endorses a document with his signature may well be told that his signature is not acceptable. They would much rather have his seal. Because this is the real sign to these people of this person's actual existence. The seal is the person. But unfortunately, nothing is easier to fabricate. And while it is not likely that a living person's seal will be imitated, there are rigid laws about it, still there is no reason why ancient marks cannot be easily imitated. So while it might uh, uh, at least indicate what the piece is supposed to be, it does little more than confirm the appearance. But what the uh, real critic is looking for is traditional methods, patterns, ways of doing things, which change with time and which the ordinary forger may well fail to imitate. For example, in most Ming ceramics, or those of later date, uh, vases were made to stand in bases. And as a result of that, a kind of secondary rim was placed around the bottom so that it would fit neatly into the little teak wood stand. Earlier pieces never had this rim. So the man looking for an old piece may gain from that what he will never be able to learn from the possible fabrication of a seal. But it is to be observing. It is to see what <coughs> should be seen. Or as the dealer may say, to see that which the imitator hopes you will not see. That is just the point. And in all of this type of thing, the same drift has occurred that occurs in our modern way of life. Almost all reproductions are inferior. They are not inferior by the mere fact that they are reproductions. They are inferior by the fact that with the passing of time in both East and West, the quality of workmanship has gradually depressed. One reason perhaps was that the rising tide of economic need did not permit the artisan to spend as long at his labor. Or perhaps the original artist, like some of the European masters, lived under the favor of a prince who financed him and therefore gave him complete leisure. The copyist did not have this leisure. He is trying to create a livelihood, and he must do it by in some way cheapening his wares. So the great test of all things is the cheapening or the loss of quality of things. Now we observe this in life around us all the time now. Year after year, a cheapening is going on. The quality of merchandise 
entirely apart from art, is falling rapidly. Uh, uh, the so-called guarantees and promises have little or no significance. Consequently, the buyer is faced not only with the problem of bewareness, but he is faced with the need for ever-increasing observation in the effort to, to, to secure, if possible, the best available product. This means further uh, support to his own resources. If he buys observingly and thoughtfully, his purchases will last longer and his funds will be conserved. Consequently, this continual awareness, this almost subconscious instinct for fineness, pays off even in the most ordinary walks of life. It pays off continuously in, prevent us, in preventing us from being imposed upon uh, by secondary merchandise. If we once gain a certain sense of value, we have gained with it the skill to discover a better level of value. We also come, of course, ultimately head on into the problem of uh, the bargain, uh, whether or not we can hope to get something below its reasonable value. In order to be a smart shopper, for example, a housewife will gradually develop an almost intuitive grasp of value. She may go to a sale where a great deal of merchandise is displayed. She has learned that when these sales are open to the public, a few good items may be concealed in a mass of trash. Much of the goods offered at the sale is not reduced at all. It is merely put in with the other smaller amount of valuable merchandise to increase bulk and to uh, bring sale from the unobservant, from the unthoughtful. So that it is possible for her to go through a stock and find a few things of better value. Otherwise, merely bargain hunting, she may buy the goods at more than its normal retail price. She has to know. There is no substitute for this knowledge. We value this uh, skill where it applies directly to dollar saving. But we also should learn to value it where it applies to character protection, which is one of the areas in which value plays a very important part. We are imposed upon largely because we do not use the faculties and powers with which we have been naturally endowed. The average person today uses only about 20% of his brain potential. A large part of his mentality is never exercised because he is surrounded by so many protecting devices that his own thought processes are actually discouraged or prevented from functioning. Also, on an emergency, when he needs them, they are available only untrained and without any adequate background and experience in the problem which presents itself. So we have faculties, we have powers which can protect us from deceit if we know how to use these powers. We also have powers within our own minds which will protect us uh, from surrounding our consciousness with non-valuable material. There can be no doubt whatever that the psychological influence of the things we have affects our character, affects our natures, affects our inward consciousness. If, therefore, we are without the realization and consciousness of discrimination, uh, we do lower our environment. We may be spending more on it, but we are getting less for it. Now, a problem of value would present, was presented to us with stark realism in the recent terrible fires in Bel Air and surrounding areas in West, western Los Angeles. Here we had people who built magnificent homes right up against a continuing fire hazard. They were warned not only by 
authorities, but by their insurance agents, that this situation existed. Many of these persons had homes full of valuable things, but they did not take adequate protection. They were not aware, they didn't hear the voice of experience and the warnings of those who attempted to protect them. They continued thoughtlessly and thereby took upon themselves a very heavy loss. To the thoughtful person, the first word of warning would have stirred sufficient internal activity to have caused adequate steps to be taken. But these persons simply didn't listen. They didn't care. They didn't believe. They didn't read the papers. They did not know that others in similar locations had suffered loss. There was a complete lack of thoughtfulness. And this lack of thoughtfulness was paid for in the terms of millions of dollars worth of material loss, to say nothing of tremendous loss of rare art, literature, and irreplaceable treasures of families and even of the nation. This type of thing simply shows poor value sense. Again, in our way of life, we have gradually uh, come to be wrongly educated in value. We have failed to recognize the importance of protecting that which is good. We do not protect the good public servant. We do not properly reward the good workman. We do not make any effort whatever to discriminate between the levels of services that are rendered to us. As a result, the level slowly falls. Whereas thoughtfulness, discrimination, and integrity could have maintained these levels. Once they are gone, they are desperately difficult to restore. We have lost pride in the productions of our own efforts. The average family today has lost pride in its own ingenuity, in its own ability to use its resources well. Most families have lost pride in economy regarding extravagance as the true symbol of the American way of life. These losses of essential values must be paid for in many ways, including much suffering and deprivation. And all that is really necessary to correct the situation is the gradual education of our own consciousness and the experience of knowing what is good. Now it's true that we live in several worlds simultaneously. There is a larger world where our greater goods are involved. But there is also the smaller world of private experimentation and effort. Perhaps the smaller world of a particular interest becomes a laboratory in which we can experiment with principles that we can apply in many other areas as time goes on. So if we choose something as a symbol of the entire search for value, as for example art, we are only making a laboratory experiment. In art we can control many factors. For example, an individual makes his own decision. He buys something. He thinks it's good. Later he discusses with an expert and he finds out that it is not good. He learns why he was overcharged and he learns why his purchase was unwisely made. This whole situation may involve a few days of time and maybe ten, twenty, or fifty dollars in money. Here the whole pattern works out. We can see the complete picture. But when we make a mistake in value of life and go out into the larger theater of our activity, this mistake may cost us dear. It may go on through for years and we may never find the true expert who can tell us what is wrong. Consequently, by using the smaller theater of experimentation, we gain the experience and develop the faculties which we can then apply to larger and more diversified areas of activity. This is one of the principles behind art. This is one of the reasons why uh, a collector gradually becomes uh, more enlightened in value. It isn't that the things he is collecting are always important. Perhaps they are not important at all. But he is gaining an important sharpening of his own consciousness. 
He is learning to think more clearly. He is learning to understand more deeply. And most of all, he is learning to try to appreciate abstract value. In the presence of a great masterpiece of art, a true connoisseur may give a little, explana a little exclamation of almost ecstasy. He sees something that is so wonderful that he can hardly restrain himself. We look at the same thing and we say, well, I, I guess it's all right. It, I don't see anything extraordinary about it. Uh, I think they had something like that down at Newberry's once. <laughs> and uh, we, uh, we pass it at that. But what did the expert see that we missed? Why does he suddenly sense something as being of tremendous value? And to us it's just something else that uh, perhaps if we had it we'd give it away gladly. In fact, you'd be surprised how many great treasures have actually been found uh, in the uh, trash cans out in front of people's houses. They've given away the wrong thing. They've thrown out something priceless and replaced it with something worthless. These things happen. Many very interesting and rare antiques have been found in dump yards. Why? Because the wrong people had them. People who did not know value. But what is the difference? How can we uh, try to understand uh, what this expert sees that we do not understand or do not comprehend? One thing he must see, or he wouldn't be interested at all, is beauty. He must see important beauty. He must see some form of extraordinary creative excellence, or he would not be moved nor interested. Why do we not see the same thing? Why are we not touched inwardly by the tremendous surge of appreciation that has risen in him? The only answer is that we're not trained, that we are not used to using those faculties in that way. We are used to measuring mediocrities. We have gone to school, we've learned a great many simple values about daily things, but we haven't learned abstract value. We haven't learned to grasp the beautiful and to find in it something essential to our own well-being. Probably if we ask this uh, connoisseur why he was so tremendously attracted to a certain item, he might try to tell us. When he gets all through, we would probably agree with him and still not know what he was talking about. Because we would look exactly where we, he pointed, but we wouldn't see what he saw. To us, we would, uh, we would see a very pleasant little area, perhaps of porcelain, with a nice color on it. To him, he sees something perhaps unique. Maybe that particular example is the only piece of its kind in the United States. Perhaps he knows who created it and realizes that in some mysterious way a treasure has escaped the observant eyes of collectors and dealers and has suddenly appeared within his reach. He knows, therefore he appreciates. And appreciation must be built upon knowledge. And this is true in every department of life. Another point that we find in working with this, as we said, is the need for the immediate decision. And this comes upon even those who have considerable interest in these matters. Uh, the ancient rule on the subject is for the expert. If you know that it is great and you can get it, get it. If you are not sure whether it is great or not, and you are an expert, leave it alone. Because if you do not take it, and you are not sure, and you are an expert, your subconscious is ringing a bell. There's something wrong, even though your consciousness may not be able to tell what it is. Whenever you are seriously in doubt, whenever you say to yourself, I don't feel quite right about this, uh, the great collector leaves the item alone. He senses in some way that the offense arises from his own psychic level of appreciation. His consciousness is not really happy with this particular item. 
Now, what makes consciousness happy? Uh, apparently, the real answer to this lies that consciousness is always happy when it recognizes something upon its own level. When it recognizes perfection, consciousness being of itself a perfect thing somewhere in its own source, even though it may not manifest perfectly, consciousness recognizes consciousness in other things. Consciousness recognizes the skill of the great artisan. Consciousness shares in a superlative appreciation for that which is superlative. And from ourselves comes a sense of contentment, a sense of justification, a sureness that what we are considering arose also from a great consciousness. And this has to lie behind every achievement in creativity that is important. So if we are in doubt uh, and something says to hesitate, then it is not wise to proceed. Or it's certainly we should proceed with the greatest caution and thoroughness and protect ourselves in every way possible. Now the same thing should happen when we meet people or when we come upon any problem in life. I have talked to a great many persons who have brought their problems, particularly problems involving other people. And in the course of a discussion, they may say, well, you know, it's a strange thing, but when I first met that person, I didn't get a good feeling from them. But gradually, I decided it was my own temperament or my own snobbishness or something, and in the course of time, I more or less forgot my original feeling. Now I suddenly realize that that original feeling was right. But it is only after considerable time that we get around to the proving of this intuitive flash that we had at the beginning. Therefore, we should always be mindful of these intuitive flashes. Now, there are certain persons who, by nature, are so critical, they will criticize everyone. This, of course, represents, again, a total loss of value, and therefore, their judgment is not important. But where we have naturally no antagonisms, no antipathies, no prejudices about a thing, Yet at the very beginning of it, we sense something that isn't right. We sense the feeling that this is not good. Then we shouldn't let the hope for profit or the hope for improved fortune cause us to depart from that which we know instinctively to be right. Because if we mentalize this long enough, we will kill out this consciousness flash that we had. We will explain it away but we will not change the circumstances. And maybe five years later or ten years later, this intuitive flash will come through again. Now, there are cases psychologically in which this intuitive sensing has gone even further than this. I know one case in which a person thinking of going in business, in a business which would have involved a considerable amount of commitment, uh, had a little of this intuitive sense against the prospective business partner. But because the credentials were excellent, because the man's reputation apparently was above the question, the person felt, felt that his superstitions were uh, not proper, that he, he shouldn't feel that way. He had no reason to be suspicious of this other man. It was just some mood of his. But a few days before the time came for him finally to consummate this business transaction, he had a very important and impressive dream about it. The consciousness which was trying to warn him had not quite gotten through on the conscious level. Therefore, it came out in a powerful dream pattern, a dream of warning that was so real that this person could not resist it, and he did not complete the transaction. And it was very fortunate that he did not because actually the entire uh, situation uh, was a misrepresentation and very close to outright dishonesty. But the psychic nature had sensed this. Now, how did the psychic nature sense it? Some will say, perhaps, that uh, there was a certain clairvoyant faculty involved, that the uh, person's inner life became aware, perhaps almost a sort of telepathic communication in which the negative thought of the dishonest person was picked up 
by the potential victim and uh, saved the victim from the difficulty that threatened. This may be true. There is probably a, there are occasions where this is undoubtedly true. But I wonder if it is consistently the pattern. Because if it was, how could a very intuitive collector have the same feeling equally strong and perhaps a dream equally impressive about a piece of tapestry that is 500 years old? We might say that the tapestry was haunted or something of that nature, but this gets the situation into a rather abstract atmosphere. Uh, it is far more likely that this person actually saw the fraud, but did not know how to interpret what he saw. That, however, his own subconscious picked up this forgery or this misrepresentation and was able to finally bring it through through some symbolic medium. Perhaps in this case, simply a violent sense of don't buy it, I don't like it. Or perhaps again, some kind of a dream experience. There's one case of a dream of this kind in which a man was buying an expensive uh, antique Egyptian jewel or piece of jewelry that was quite expensive. And he actually had a dream in which this figure appeared to him and told him that it was bogus, that it was a reproduction, and it later proved to be. In New York, there has been a plate that being distrib has been distributed among every art dealer practically in the Western Hemisphere. This plate is supposed to be a, ch a marvelous vessel from a Byzantine altar at St. Sophia's, a priceless thing. Uh, dozen great collectors and great dealers have examined it. Not one of them ever found out that it was bad. But for some reason, none of them ever bought it. That was one of the peculiar things. Something always happened. The price was high. It was priced in the five figures and well into them. And it was passed on by the experts of every gallery and museum you could think of. But this piece has gone begging for years. Whereas other pieces with much less credential have found happy homes long ago. <laughs> and then all of a sudden the bubble burst and the man who made it confessed. <coughs> Instead of having been manufactured by some ancient craftsman 1,500 years ago, it was made in the Bronx about 1910. <laughs> and not one of the persons who turned it down knew this. But for some reason the plate went begging. Although it had enough endorsement to have convinced the greatest skeptic. But nobody quite liked it, although it was a beautiful piece of work. So the expert learns in one way or another this overtone. If we could get this kind of instinct into our transactions with people on various levels, we'd have a lot more honesty in this world. We would discourage a great deal of fabrication and forgery, and various impoverishments of quality in various products uh, that we commonly purchase. But we just do not get this sense of value operating correctly. Now, value carries on into other things. I know persons of very moderate means who, having come into the presence of something that they instinctively knew was good, have gone far beyond prudence and judgment in the effort to acquire that thing. To them its value was so very real and so very important that they did not dare to hesitate. Under those conditions, most of these transactions came out very well because, of course, the essential element was this enlightened sincerity, which is very hard to deceive once you have attained it. So these persons have have extended their resources in the direction of value uh, almost imp imprudently, but actually very wisely, as time itself always proved. So to know and to grasp value is itself a tremendously important decision to make. And here we have again a decision in life. 
when we start out living or when we're at any period in life, what should we do about value? Uh, when the opportunity arises for something that we know is good or know is necessary or know is right, are we willing fully to stand behind this and give everything we have to it? Have we sense enough to recognize opportunity, to recognize it for exactly what it is, and to be so skillful in our knowledge that we could not be deceived? If we have this opportunity, then do we have the courage uh, to give full weight to our own intuition and do the thing that we know is correct? We have people all the time who come in and say, well, I, I knew years ago that what I'm doing wasn't right, but I, I just kept on doing it anyway, and I just wonder why I'm in a mess now. It's just this type of thing. There wasn't any clear sense of knowing what is right and doing it. To get, therefore, this, uh, this credit out of value, to get, make value work for you, it must create this censorship and discrimination and intensify our own abilities uh, to decide to cling to value, to do that which is indicated as the best and wisest thing to do. Now, this value does not mean in terms of money. I'm not thinking in terms of investment primarily. I'm thinking in terms of character, in terms of those decisions which make for happiness or unhappiness within ourselves as living creatures. For here is where value operates most positively at all times. So we say, the Chinese say at least, that we must reach out and take hold upon value. That uh, we should always uh, choose that which is best in the presence of a number of possible decisions. And to do this, we must have thoughtfulness, and to this we must have training, and we must have experience, and we must have all of these elements of maturity which make it possible for us to recognize value, give ourselves the courage to accept the challenge of value, and then the patience to perfect whatever elements are necessary in the transaction. These conditions are not commonly found today. The person of today is not thoughtful, he is not skillful in the determination of value, he is not particularly interested in training himself for any of these activities. I know in philosophy particularly how indifferent people are to the more subtle phases of emotional reaction to that which is fine or good. Religion and philosophy, instead of deepening the sense of values, make us hasten over them without giving them uh, adequate consideration. Perhaps that's why so much of our religious life is not adequate and not mature and not helpful to us in our own emergency. So let's try to take a few little simple illustrations paralleling different fields of activity and see what we mean now by taking hold of value and trying to do something with it, do something to make uh, things better for all concerned. We are, we'll say, moderately educated people. We've had enough schooling to be able to make a living. We have enough skill in, uh, in some art or trade to be able to have a measure of proficiency in it. We are managing some way to get along from day to day. We don't exactly know how ourselves, and nobody else seems to be able to give us much instruction on it. But here we are, more or less drifting. Uh, tomorrow is another day, which will gradually look more and more like this one as we begin to live it. There is no particular reason to assume that we're going to wake up tomorrow any smarter than we were when we went to bed. And uh, there's not much but, uh, of incentive in it. One thing that value requires is incentive. Now, where do we find this incentive by which an individual is suddenly shaken out of a rut and becomes dynamically concerned with something? 
Uh, he, this uh, problem of drifting along from day to day, bored largely, or wasting time, or worrying about ourselves, there doesn't seem to be much dynamic in us. If you, if you can transfer this situation to somebody who, as one man I know years ago, collected glass doorknobs. Now, there is what you might term the ultimate end of some kind of culture. I don't know just <laughs> what kind it is. The only other parallel to it that I know of is blown glass paperweights. <laughs> now, uh, this person, however, really considered doorknobs uh, to be something apart from almost every other value in life. God created the world in seven, six days, rested on the seventh, and on the eighth day he made doorknobs. <laughs> I don't know what the situation was, but these doorknobs were little less than an obsession. This was, he was a lonely man. He didn't have too many general interests in life. He didn't have a kind of income that would enable him to collect Van Dykes. Therefore... He had something, however, that just made life wonderful for him. Every day he rose in the morning filled with hope that before dark he would find another doorknob. <laughs> and he usually did. Sometimes he had great days when he found two doorknobs. He had a house full of them. Perhaps a psychologist would regard this as a symbol of compound infantilism. I don't know. But this man had a lot of fun with doorknobs. And so many people who are much too intelligent to collect doorknobs don't have any fun at all <laughs> about anything. This man had something. Not only this, but it led him into a great deal of research. He began to find out all kinds of interesting things about who made doorknobs. Maybe no one else in the community was interested but in the end, he hoped he was going to write the only authoritative textbook on doorknobs. And I'll wager you that if he does it, he will probably win a prize. Because it all fits into a funny little pattern. This man had achieved something. He became an authority on doorknobs. Most people never become an authority on anything. Now, when he departs from this life, as he most certainly will, he's going to leave all his doorknobs behind. But he's going to take with him a very interesting, adventurous consciousness, because he did something. And other people are going to leave the practical things that they did instead behind. And the man that laughs at the man who collected doorknobs is going to leave his guilt edge securities behind when he goes also. And uh, when this little mortal span is finished... The value of doorknobs and gilded edge securities are not going to be very different to that person. It's all part of life. But out of an interest came a constantly increasing awareness of some kind of value. This is important to people because it is one of the few remedies we have for the compound doldrums in which most people find themselves. Now, I can think of better things than doorknobs. I can also think of better, of better things than another man I knew who had about 20,000 different old campaign buttons of Republican and Democratic candidates, most of whom are forgotten. In this collection alone, the names of who might have been a senator or who might have been a congressman are, all, are only preserved in just such things as these. No one really cares, but it was exciting to find another campaign button. This person at least was doing something to fight against his own boredom. And uh, regardless of whether what he collected was any good or not, this individual sh was gradually developing <coughs> resources of faculty and consciousness. Someday he might collect better things. Someday this power might go into an entirely different channel infinitely more profitable to mankind. But there was, a, there was action. The mind was being used in some way. The faculties of observation were being developed. Some hobbies have develop only one faculty, memory. But the average person even needs that. One faculty will develop observation of color. This can be useful. 
Perhaps someday this person may become an artist. But whatever we do is better than not to do anything. And we must constantly strive to develop observation and reflection. Classification. Now, when you start studying psychological faculty problems, for instance, there is nothing, perhaps, uh, that would seem to be very creative in the collecting of some uh, small, trivial things. For instance, a collection of the coins of Syracuse, these beautiful gold, silver, and bronze coins of ancient Greece. Uh, there doesn't seem to be much creativity about collecting such things. If you have the money, the interest, you can collect them. But I've never seen two collectors of these types of things who presented their collections in the same way. The artistry of the collector may be expressed in the magnificent way in which he brought these things together in a wonderful, dramatic pattern. He didn't create the coins. He didn't design them. But he at least knew how to present them in display so that other persons got the maximum impact from them. Another man with just as much money collecting somewhat similar objects kept them all in a canvas bag. There was, there was no way. There's the artistry of the individual does come out. And we have to create it. We have to escape from this absolute lack of interest in anything beyond the daily problem, the daily grind of things. We have to have these positive release mechanisms. If we do not, we are candidates for serious psychological problems, especially now, where the tensions and the tempers of many people are on severe edge. There has to be this creativity. So out of all of this problem, we, we come up with a luxury factor that doesn't seem to mean anything. And yet around this luxury factor may come the greatest actual growth that we make. A person who lives 70 years, 75, 80 years, and dies without having touched creativity, has simply lived a very provident, prudent, orderly, matter-of-fact, utterly dull existence. This person has very little to take with them. Whatever they have in the form of inner consciousness is all they can take. What does this person have to take? Almost nothing. They've never even experienced real joy in anything. They've never had any fun at anything they've done. It's all been problem, work, seriousness, and made massive decisions involving anything from ten dollars to ten million dollars but very dull non-creative non-self-expressive and certainly not inclined to create any consciousness which calls upon faculties for verification I forgot to mention incidentally the doorknobs have been counterfeited there are rare doorknobs you can pay thousands of dollars for a doorknob. And the problem, therefore, also is discrimination as to whether it's worth it or not. But whatever the problem is, faculties are brought into play. Something is stirred up in the individual. He likes something very much. And that is more than most people ever really do. It's amazing how little color comes into the majority of human lives, particularly the color that arises from rejoicing, from victory over circumstance, from the discovery of something long sought. We don't have that type of experience, and as a result, our temperaments are impoverished. So we like to think that this problem of value has something to do with the enthusiasm of life, that this enthusiasm of life is contagious. We also know that people who have these interests are easier people to live with. Uh, that they are not by any means as difficult to work with. Persons with interests and dramatic and dynamic outlets are nice to be around usually. Whereas persons with none of these outlets get very heavy, tiresome, tiring kinds of attitudes. 
which are hard to live with. So value should make us always try to enrich life with something that is not just necessary. I know people who say that uh, these frills upon the circumference of existence are meaningless. After all, uh, life is a very serious business, and there's no time really to fritter away in, in foolish avocational activities. I've known these people, but they weren't very friendly people. They were not the kind of people that made good grandparents or good friends. They were people who lived very much in the square-toed Puritanism in which it seems as though even a smile is little less than sacrilegious. They were not the kind of people who have warm, happy, healthy lives. So it's, it's sometimes very good in a sense of value uh, to, to simply uh, remember this thought that Muhammad gave us, namely that had he two coats, he would sell one and buy uh, pink hyacinths for his soul. You have, to, you have to do something with these things for the soul. And the soul wants to be fed graciousness, beauty, charm, perhaps almost childish enthusiasm over something. The moment life loses its enthusiasm, we might just as well lie down and call it a day. It is enthusiasm that makes life. And enthusiasm comes from two words, entheos, which means in God. Therefore, the enthusiast is living in God. He is living in some kind of a spiritual state of active awareness. And uh, it's hard to get enthusiasm unless the mind can move out of what we term the necessary into some larger vista which we might almost consider to be an extravagant place to live. But what is extravagance? I think extravagance can occur to a very practical person. I know people who would consider themselves very, very thrifty, who are utterly extravagant. And I know people who, can, who would be considered highly extravagant, who are most prudent. It depends entirely on the judgment of another person whose interests may be different. A more well-rounded, well-balanced life, capable of releasing intuitive faculties and becoming uh, more or less integrated as a conscious being. Now, what would you suggest? How would we go around to help this person to do this? Well, the first thing we've got to find out, of course, is why he comes. And the reason he's there, usually, uh, is because he's not satisfied with what he is or what he is doing. If he was successful in every sense of the word, he wouldn't be asking help from anybody. He has come because perhaps one of a half a dozen situations has set in. He's lost, lost a loved one. Therefore, he looks forward to loneliness and wants to do something about that. He is nearing retirement age. He has made no preparation for this. Therefore, this particular problem confronts him. He can't, after all, cut the lawn every day. He has to have some other activity besides weeding the garden. Presuming he has a garden. Also, perhaps his doctor told him that he's got to ease up. That he's too strenuous, that he's worrying too much. That he's getting an ulcer. You've got to learn to relax. Well, it's awfully hard to learn to relax when you can't think of anything that's interesting. Some other situation may arise. At uh, almost anything. But the person is here seeking help simply because he suddenly recognizes a need or a defect in himself. So you can say to this person, perhaps to start off with, when you were young and growing up and starting out in life, what was your dream? Did you really dream that you were going to be in coats and suits? <laughs> Did you dream that you were going to be an agent for the gadgets from some large transistor house? Was this what you started out that you wanted to be? Well, the man may stop for a moment and say, well, of course, after all, the thing I wanted to be at that time was pretty stupid. No, I'm not doing what I wanted to do then, but how can I? I wanted to be an opera tenor. And I never even had the voice. Well, you, have, you can start with that. 
That's something. Or this individual who can say, well, all my life I've been in an office, but what I wanted to do really was to go to sea on a ship and travel all over the world. And a housewife who has had quite an experience and is now a grandmother says, well, if you must know, I wanted to be a toe dancer. These are the problems that you get when you go back to try to find out what people wanted to be. Yet from these things that they wanted to be, you can often find a secret and locked situation. And if we could have found that out earlier, in many cases, there would be fewer people in our mental institutions. Because while in some cases they were able to carry this conflict rather well, in other cases they never could. And this thing they always wanted to be and never could be absolutely ruined their psychological integration and they never recovered it. But we have all these people now and we have to find out where we can start with these people. It's obvious that they can't take up a new career as they would have at 20. Life circumstances no longer permit this. But there is somewhere lurking in this problem some way of centering them again on the one thing that every human being must ultimately come back to, and that is the release of his own consciousness through creativity. This has to come. If it doesn't come, he's lost. The person who always wanted to be a musician may not be a great musician and may never be able to. But they can still do something because here their full instinct is located. And even at 80 or 85, they can start. They can express themselves in some way. They can take hold of a value which they need. And they can decide how much they're willing to sacrifice to take hold of that value. It may be that for a person in advanced years to buy an elaborate or expensive musical instrument is a real hardship. But if that music has waited for 50 years to come out, it must come out for that person's good. And that is not an expenditure, it is an investment. Because they must learn creativity. Now other people can develop the same lessons in a simpler way. Some individuals have, great many persons in our way of life, have had a frustrated desire to be artistic. Artistry meant something to them as children. They had a little skill in drawing, but they never were ch had a chance to do much with it. Long came life and set in with its problems. This artistry perhaps never got any further than maybe helping their children to draw a few pictures uh, in, child in their childhood. But this actually remains. Here is a potential area of creativity that the person brought with him into life. Something must be done to make sure that he takes that creativity out of this life further advanced than when he came in. His success in life will not be measured in his practical, methodical procedures, but in the degree to which he has released his own creative bent, whatever it may be, his own creative instinct. Persons who can no longer create in that sense of the word can discriminate. They can discover, they can experience value. And for many, many persons, art becomes a way out. Uh, one of the reasons is that art is in almost complete defiance uh, of our common, ordinary way of doing things. Art is almost an, an autocorrective for the kind of life we now live, which is far from artistic, and which almost completely loses sight of artistry. Most persons do have an instinctive desire for fitness, uh, for the rightness of values. They want to look well. They want to have nice things. They want to uh, set themselves in a framework of things that are interesting. And this brings another curious situation to mind. Uh, I have known, I know that uh, in a large store in New York where I used to visit, uh, they got in some very fantastic Middle Eastern jewelry. It, it was amazing material, utterly dramatic. And uh, they exhibited it, and a great many very stylish people came to look at it. And many of them admired it, and many of them said they had never seen anything in their lives is remarkable. But nobody bought it. Why? 
because nobody dared to wear it. You take a person who had absolutely no personality and hang a thing like that on them. And the next time they met a friend, the friend would say, how do you do? That's a five piece of jewelry you have. You wouldn't see the person anymore at all. The person was too weak to carry it. An interesting adornment must be carried by a still more interesting person, or it eclipses the person. And the next thing you know, they get an invitation to, to send the pin and not come themselves. <laughs> Nobody's interested in them, but everyone would like to see the pin. <laughs> Anything that is remarkable, different, startling, dramatic, can only serve a person who is able to carry it. Otherwise, it destroys that personality. The individual develops an inferiority complex to what he's wearing. So in order to, uh, to live in an interesting place, to surround ourselves with interesting things, we must be interesting. Otherwise, we rattle around in something we don't fit into. And someone says to another person after they leave, that's a marvelous house. How in the world did that person ever get to move into it? Wrong. We've lost leadership by being surrounded by interest and not having any interest in us. So this is one of the reasons why uh, it is so important for the individual to always lead his interest. This is why in taking hold of value, it is not important merely to own something. That something must express value in us. We must always uh, lead this value. We must always be in control of it. If this value is something that represents centuries of culture in its production, it should be worn or carried by a person who has matured even more centuries of consciousness within themselves. Otherwise, uh, there is discord. There's a hopeless situation that nothing can be done about. But there is there always this important problem of the person leading his own cultural environment. And he can do it, but he has to think about it. He can have the courage to do it if he will give himself uh, the insight necessary uh, to mature his own activity and interest. This is one of the reasons why everything having a story Everything must be done for a reason, and everything that we have must have meaning to us. We must understand it. Uh, we must know why it is good. We must be able to appreciate that value in our own consciousness. Then it belongs to us by a natural uh, and wonderful uh, power of possession. We possess what we need, what we must have. And in some wonderful way, these things do come. Things are forever hunting for people. It isn't true that people are always just looking for things. Things are out looking for the people who can use them. And something happens and they come together when consciousness is right. Well, that's another phase of our problem. But we start out with these people who are, are trying to find activities, trying to find interests. I know a great many rather serious people these days who are taking up various interesting subjects with the understanding that every new subject that we take up opens a door. Now this door that is opened usually opens into the creativity of our collective race. The person who suddenly discovers the creativity of man collectively suddenly finds himself a member of a magnificently interesting creature, a society of beings that he thought was a very dull society. But because he's gotten under the surface now and begun to move with the creativity of these people, he discovers that he is living in a world of extraordinary values if he is able to appreciate them. He learns that the simplest thing done well is a magnificent thing. So he opens doors wherever he touches the creativity of life. A man, a woman who studies a language, not his own, opens a door. 
opens a door into a world not just of somebody else's speech, but of the psychology of peoples. To know people's language is to have a tremendous bond of union. To know a language is to understand more and more the soul of a people. And a whole universe of values is simply opened by this circumstance alone. I know a man who, having suffered a leg injury by which he was not going to be able to continue to get around very much, went down and studied in our southwest with some of our, the Navajo Indian silversmiths and became quite adroit and expert in molding and mounting uh, silver uh, with turquoise and other stones. He wasn't an Indian, but he gained a tremendous admiration of the magnificent craft of these people. He found he'd gone down to take three months study with them so he could find a hobby. He spent several years with them and gradually learned to know that even behind casting a simple Indian buckle, there was a, a world of thought, a world of skill, a world of wise methods and ancient traditions and wonderful lore. And when he came back and not being able to get around, he had his little table, he had his wheelchair and he would sit in front of his table and work with these things. He not only finally made some magnificent things in the Indian techniques, but he suddenly discovered that all this technique, now he had mastered it, gave expression to himself. And he made some tremendously interesting and dramatic original uh, ornamentations and devices. He found a world of self-expression in this. He found that this fact, the fact that he could turn out a beautiful piece of molded silver into an exquisite design gave him more satisfaction, more peace of soul than all his bank account could possibly bestow. Uh, and he had the sense of creativity, that God in him was moving because God is God primarily because of the great creative power which lies at the root of life and whatever has creativity moving into expression has God coming into manifestation through that creativity so there are all kinds of things to do nearly always our soul satisfaction does not lie in purely intellectual hobbies our soul satisfaction lies in bright glittery, silvery things that bring peace and joy and sparkle with them. Therefore, uh, we usually collect articles or items of some beauty or of meaning. Another individual decided that he was going to attempt to decode Egyptian hieroglyphs. But he wasn't particularly uh, addicted to such literary pursuits. It was interesting. He had a lot of fun with it. He spent several years working until he was pretty good at reading these glyphs, and he found some very interesting inscriptions. But he gradually hopped past this into something else. The first thing you know, Egyptian religion, Egyptian philosophy, Egyptian mysticism uh, came through and took over. But he found the knowledge of the language extremely valuable, and it enabled him to decode many documents not generally known and to correct misinterpretations bearing upon the religious beliefs of these people. So he started with one thing, but he went on to what was his real interest. But this person could not be bored. This person could not any longer drop back into the mediocrity of just living from day to day. Each day was an adventure. And uh, this type of adventuring is a much richer life than can ever be gained in the levels of success as we know them. Because success still leaves us bored. It leaves us numbed as far as value is concerned. So another person at a suggestion uh, took up working with children, uh, particularly children who had minor physical defects. This person was very much interested in the problems of children, but not just merely association. They had a feeling that in some way these defective children could be uh, given a consciousness in life which would enable them to go on and have great lives and not be caught in the 
uh, negation of some defect. The fact that the child was club-footed should not be, sh should not actually ruin the life of that child. Something had to be done to make that child's life so important that this deformity was not, in, not significant uh, any more than the fact that Steinmetz was a hunchback made very much important difference. He was still regarded as one of the great men of his time, and uh, he certainly was not limited to any serious degree by his physical uh, deformity. He simply had a life so rich that he could carry this deformity uh, with graciousness and with wonderful insight. And this man believed that children could be worked with in this way. He started something. And he gradually proved that he was right. And he was able to make some very interesting contributions to improving young people. And knowing this very sensitive period, say the first six or eight years of life, when these deformities become uh, suddenly a separating factor between one child and another, he worked through that period. That was many years ago, and some of the children he worked with have now grown up. And they are all much the better for having known him. He made something interesting out of something. He found his artistry in this way. But everyone must have some creative self-expression. And when the opportunity for this comes, he must grasp that opportunity because it is the greatest value that can come into his life. And uh, depending on the circumstances and backgrounds and interests, limitations, means, uh, localities where we live, these values have to unfold a little differently for each person. But each individual must, in this lifetime, to fulfill the purpose of life, not only be a provident person, a sincere person, and an intelligent person, but a person with dynamic interest in value. If he can achieve this, he then has uh, some very good karmic patterns working for him and helping him to go on into a fuller expression of his own life purpose. And this is one, of course, the lessons that we gain from the study of art, because life is the greatest of the arts. And all art is merely some way a study in life, a study in the, in the, the drama of the great spiritual emotional unfoldment of human consciousness. So in arts we have these little symbols that we can set up uh, as uh, symbols of things we are going to accomplish in our own natures. Now, I've had people come to me, for instance, also who wanted to collect art, who felt that art was going to be one way in which they were going to suddenly become a little more sensitive. They were tired of nagging their children. They were tired of having their children nag them. They were tired of sitting around waiting for their arteries to harden. They wanted to do something. And having some means and some intelligent understanding and grasp, they decided they were going to take up some form of the simple thing which we call collecting. Now, collecting is a kite with a very long tail. Because when you start collecting, you say, I'm going to get three of these and put them in a row. You get the three of them in the row and you say, they don't look right there. You've got to do something about it. And first thing you know, playing, well, shall we say, secretary to your own art, your own art begins to affect you. And you can't have great art without any artistry in yourself. It begins to scream and yell. You have to mature in order to live with it. You have to learn what to do with it. You have to learn to think about it. Or else... Little by little, it, it becomes a tyrant over your affairs. So, uh, starting out on some field of this nature, we say, what are the situations that affect people? The American people today are more art conscious, probably, than we will ever realize. The one art, however, which has gained almost complete general favor is music. Music has become, to the American people, a tremendously redeeming force at this time in our social life. Music is the one art uh, which we are willing to accept because it gives a tremendous amount 
and to the average person does not demand a great deal. Uh, music can be very demanding. Music can cause the listener to become a great musicologist in his own right, but he can also just be a good listener. And that is where it is most of the time with us. There is, however, one little ulterior fact in here which we mustn't overlook, that in our modern interest of music there's a good deal of mechanics involved. The average person today has become so tremendously in interested in high fidelity and stereophonic sound and so forth that he is gradually changing from a music lover into an electrical engineer. Now, this is not quite the original intention, but I know people who can't tell you the name of a single composer, but they know every element of a 300 circuit that they have with more you know, little pins and little switches and tiny little fuses in it than you could ever count. They know every one of them by name, but they don't know a single piece they hear over it. So this can get out of control also. And there can be the man who victoriously announced that he finally had the most perfect set in the world because when he played a certain recording on it, he could hear Leopold Strakowski breathe. This, uh, <laughs> this was the final proof that he had a great uh, uh, set of uh, a great musical equipment. So this is a common occurrence, but art with us, other than music, has been terribly neglected. Some funny things have happened, too. Some of them uh, rather interesting and others still a little pathetic. One of the most interesting, curious, and almost a little pathetic things has happened is that you can now take out pictures in color from the public library on your library card, keep them at home and live with them for 30 days, and then bring them back and get another one. Now this is, I would say, a streamlined way of introducing art to the American home. Incidentally, you should see the pictures you can get out. <laughs> I've seen them. <laughs> and in the spirit of the time, most of them are, are pretty bad. They're famous, but they're pretty bad. <laughs> Other cases now, you can rent pictures by the month. Also, uh, I think far more to the point, for a small additional fee, the gallery will send someone to decide what picture you should have. <laughs> After all, there is this problem of the wallpaper and the drapes. You can't have a picture that screams against the upholstery. So an interior decorator will help you to choose a picture that is just what you have always wanted, whether you know it or not. So art has a hard time in our way of life. It's a stepchild. We have forgotten that art is not a luxury of the rich, but a necessity of all peoples. We have not learned to realize uh, that art is civilization whether it be music, or painting, or drama, or literature, or poetry. There's something very serious and wrong with a culture in which no book of poems can sell over 500 copies, no matter who writes it. Of course, some of them aren't worth any more than that, but some are. But you cannot get any recognition for poetry. You can get very little recognition for good theater. You can get very little recognition for any of these dramatic arts. They must be very flamboyant, very literal, literal, and very noisy today in order to get any attention at all. Not to say the least that they must, must also be quite vulgar to be really successful. This type of thing is bad. It shows not that we are simply lacking art culture, it shows that we are falling apart. It shows that our whole culture is weakening. And it also shows that there is going to be more crime more misery, more psychological breakdowns, uh, more juvenile delinquency, more dope addiction, more acute alcoholism, unless this situation is cured. Because this collapse of culture is the collapse of a people. And if it goes beyond a certain uh, degree, the nation or the race involved will not survive. So it becomes rather important to take hold on some of these things. Not only because we need the individual experience, but because we need to set an example for a collective experience, which is more than due. We are far too mature as a people to be merely a mechanistic industrial civilization. So we do want to do something with, these, with this artistic instinct in ourselves, uh, to find repose, to find peace, to find uh, tranquility of spirit. <coughs> and most of all, to experience some sense 
of being valuable as people. Not simply because we can support the government through taxes, but because we have a creativity in us that can support life, can support civilization, the future of a world. Also, that we can bring more creativity to the lives of children around us and those whose lives are directly influenced by our own attitudes towards living. So we can take up other fields also. Uh, some people can take up writing. They can attempt creative writing. We can write anything we want to as long as we don't expect to get it published. But that isn't the point. Many of the greatest literary works in the world were not published at all during the lifetime of the author. They were hidden somewhere and 500 years later someone found them and thought they were rather good. It isn't important. We do not write for publication. We write primarily for expression, for creativity. And gradually, if we learn, so that we are writing not just from the fullness of our hearts, but also have a little training in writing, many people will produce better literature than they are buying. But they just don't know this. But you have to add to the desire, the willingness to train for a year or two under proper guidance and know what good writing is. This may increase vocabulary. This may uh, help us to release psychological pressure. The most successful book of every author is usually the psychological story of himself. But he's gotten it out. He's gotten release from pressures and tendencies that have held him in bondage perhaps for half a lifetime. Writing is very good. All these things are good because they make us express something. I think, the, uh, I think the Japanese idea of the 17-unit poem is a tremendously intriguing thing. And here is something that uh, could be a very great creative expression for our people. The American people are divided largely between the two groups, those who say very little and those who say too much. And uh, to get it down to a very nice, moderate situation is wonderful. It also gives us conciseness. Now, if you can do a complete poem in 17 syllables, not 17 words, 17 syllables, and this poem becomes a masterpiece, you have achieved a number of things. First, you achieve tremendous inventiveness. Secondly, you have learned not to insult the person who reads the poem by filling in all the details for him. You learn how to draw with a very broad stroke. And you can put together the elements of one simple idea. It must be completely simple. And in the simplicity of this idea, you tell a wonderful story. You make a little fragment of existence. You sum it up. You relate it to value in some way. Well, this little poem in its 17 syllables must tell a story as well as describe a circumstance. If you can do this, you have gained a new control of the dimension of language. It is something really tremendously interesting and extremely worth thinking about. You can spend a great deal of time trying to see how much you can project in the form of a conscious experience in 17 syllables. You may find in the end that a great deal has been accomplished. Well, many wonderful things have been said very quickly. Someone pointed out long ago that the largest statement in the world that we know today is a very simple statement. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. How are you going to add to that? For, the, for a magnificent statement of total spiritual value. There are tremendous things that can be captured out of life experience with utter simplicity. And this is the beginning of a great maturity of literature for a people. And it has a tremendous appeal uh, to the thoughtful person as a discipline upon his own faculties. Another, of course, oriental contribution to this problem is flower arrangement. A very interesting and dramatic area for human activity. Here we have man 
placed in a curious relationship with nature. Here we have man attempting to eliminate man and perfect art by revealing nature. To the degree that a flower arrangement indicates human activity, it is a failure. To the degree that the individual is able to arrange these flowers, leaves, and stems so that they appear that this is the way God grew them and that no one has touched them. To the degree that that can be done with the strange but inevitable abandon of divine order. To that degree you have a great flower arrangement. Great because man has inwardly sensed how nature would do this thing. This is a tremendous intuitive experience, a tremendous inspirational experience. Now it's harder for us to take hold of some abstract oriental art, such as for instance the tea ceremony. I know a great many people who have seen it, I know very few non-orientals who have appreciated it. Uh, to most western people, it is a long drawn out way of pouring a cup of tea. And are actually, because of the fact that powdered green tea is used, and you drink the powdered tea, grains and all, it's not exactly regarded as a delicious experience, even in the drinking of the tea, which is of about the consistency of sour soup. <laughs> Therefore, it is not a greatly appreciated art among other people. But what is the actual uh, idea behind it? It is complete self-discipline. It is a magnificent ability to perform a series of actions uh, with every effort made possible to transform bodily motion into perfect poetry. The, the tea master becomes a living poem. He uh, reduces the composition of this poem to a series of simple motions that almost suggest the 17-syllable poem. Everything is reduced to its starkest beauty. There isn't a wasted motion. Everything is done according to a tradition of the complete harmonic beauty of motion. It has a strange static parallel with the dance. For the tea ceremony is a kind of dance in which there is practically no motion, very little. But every movement is, is backed by the fullest consciousness of the artist. He is doing everything as though he was painting a magnificent picture. And he is doing it to an audience that appreciates what he is doing, who recognizes that it has taken him a lifetime to learn to do this. And uh, a group of critics who, if he is poor at it, will not hesitate ultimately to let him know. But if he is good at it, will respect him for all of his attainment and admire him in many other phases of his living. So this becomes a tremendous discipline of ordered self-control. The, the attempt to express creatively total beauty of motion without anything except a tea bowl and a little dipper and a feather and two or three things like that to make this action possible. So here is perfect <coughs> creative motion. And uh, only an individual who has a thoughtfulness in this area can possibly appreciate it. Or the artistry which so often associates this ceremony with uh, ceremonial suicide. It is a very subtle thing, but it represents a strange development of consciousness within this individual himself. So the artistry can take almost any form that we want or are able to use. But whatever it is, we must reach for it and take hold upon it. We must do something. And I believe that most people's lives would be far less negative in, in, the, in the hurt way most people suffer much more than they need to. Most people are sad or angry far more often than the circumstances, even at, uh, at the most exaggerated interpretation, really would justify. Because this, this quality of preoccupation in value 
has not has not come into their lives, has not given them uh, this wonderful vision of what could be if they would only let it be. Um, meditational disciplines also can create great artistry, but uh, meditation really arises out of art. Uh, wherever in Asia, especially, you find great artistry. You find your meditational life. The meditational life in the West is an escape, usually, from a negative situation. In the East, it is the projection of an already existing positive situation. Your Zen monk is a great painter. Your Shingong mystic is a great, we may say, a great musician. He pay, plays superbly upon some instrument. Uh, his artistry is tied very closely to his religion. And religion itself implies the impulse to creative expression through art. Look at Western culture for a moment. In the, fast, in the last 500 years, what great religious art has Western man produced? The last great European artist, perhaps, of, of, of dynamic, of religious art in, in Europe, may have been Albrecht Dürer. I'm not thinking now of the, of the very gentle, mystical souls, but of the ones who had tremendous dynamic in spiritual art. The only great artist in spiritual art that England ever produced was William Blake. I can't think of a single name outstanding in American art as a great interpreter of man's sacred conviction. Religious art has simply disappeared. The only thing that we get is a little maudlin sentimentalism. We get no dynamic in art. We say that Protestantism, dividing ceremonialism from the common life of the Protestant Christian, actually damaged his art instincts, because there's been very little art in Protestant Christianity. It was avoided as part of the old background that must be forgotten. There's been very little great music. Certainly, there is a wonderful, kindly sentiment in the old hymn. But as music, it is not exactly outstanding. And we do not produce greatness. Our religious life does not express through creativity. We go and sit and listen and go home again. But, the, but it doesn't move out of our lives through great music, through great painting, uh, through great... Uh, creative artistry, great theater, great literature, the, ma the real things of life that are most important to us are not articulate in our arts. And when we finally put the statue out in front of the city hall, it's something we don't know what it is after it's there. It's some absolute atrocity. We don't, we don't know. So our religious instinct is not creating self-expression. Perhaps it's because the average person isn't trained in self-expression. The average person has never taken an art lesson in his life, but he's trying to be a religious person. He needs both. He needs to have the value of knowing what is great and gradually moving his own conviction into manifestation. After he has learned to know what is good in art, he may also be able suddenly to discover that he can create it. If he doesn't know what's good, he will not know what he is creating. But religion should lead to creativity. It should lead to a tremendous dynamic in art. And if a great artist in religion should come along, this artist, for the continuance of his own uh, inspiration, or the, or the effect of his artistry upon civilization, must have those who believe in his art, who support his art, who purchase his art, Otherwise, he will starve to death and disappear again in the great silence of the unknown and unrewarded creators. He must have someone who appreciate, or he cannot produce. So all through this modern way of life, we feel this brittleness. We feel this sudden sensing that everyone would like to foreclose a mortgage on us. We have the sense that everywhere we go, someone's trying to exploit us. Yet we are not doing anything to create the warmth which prevents exploitation and makes persons have a sense of kindliness toward each other rather than a quick desire to exploit each other. 
where there's great art, there will be more understanding between people, more be understanding between families. So to reach out into this value sense, uh, I know from working a long time with people that those who have found artistic outlets have suddenly become better people, happier people, wiser people. The religion has meant something to them it never meant before. Because they have sensed that the reason why we seek inside ourselves for truth is in order that we can free truth, that it can come out. Actually, religion must come from within us into our lives into our activity. Religion is something sacred. If it moves into our lives, it must move into a uh, manifestation with the dignity and graciousness of a sacred thing. When we decide to, or when we are impelled to release religion into action, it should cause beautiful action. It should cause noble action. It should cause the kind of action which is recognized by other people as superior as something that has its root in a divine principle rather than in the common principle of human competition. Yet if we have this creative instinct, if we have this infinite desire to release religion, and we have no talent, no ability, no instrument for implementing this instinct, then we are like the individual who always wanted to be a musician but never trained his hands. We have to train. We have to gain appreciation, we have to gain sense of value. So while we are releasing religion from the inside, we are releasing discrimination from the intellectual and emotional levels of our natures. So that someday, the fact that we have gradually learned to understand what is valuable, what is beautiful, what is true, will instinctively equip us to express our own life beautifully and release our own conviction in a manner that is truly worthy of us. For there is a sermon in a beautiful thing which we have created. We are creating solely, as the old Chinese poet said, we are creating solely because God is in us. And if we turn and produce something magnificent, God is the artist. But we have become the faithful apprentices of that artist. Now God is art. God is the creative artist creating all beauty and all good things in the world can never be truly sensed or known unless we are also artists. When the time came in the alchemists of the Middle Ages to produce the mysterious transmutation of metals, they had a patron saint, a mysterious, unknown, elusive being who was called Elias Atista, Elias the artist. And those who transmuted in chemistry base metals into gold were referred to as artists. Therefore alchemy was an art, and alchemy was the transmutation of all base things into beautiful things, the reformation of human society, the transmutation of the base metal of undeveloped character into the pure gold of illumination. And these things were accomplished because of the power and the secret wisdom that was communicated by Elias Artista, the master of the alchemical mysteries, Elias the artist. And all great transmutation and transformation of self is art, the art of making a magnificent likeness of God in the nature of man himself, the skill to sculptor our own character into the likeness of truth. These are all great arts. And great arts and little arts are brethren, are brethren of different ages, but of the same family. So by gradually becoming maturely aware of beauty and of true value and of the finer things of life, we refine our own natures. And as a result of that, the divine principle moving through us manifests more purely its own magnificence. The person who has great music in his soul has already the power in some mysterious way to be closer to the music of the spheres, to be the mu to the music of the infinite. The musician can discover God as music. Uh, the artist can discover God as great art. Uh, the poet finds deity as the great poet 
whose very poems unfold in the heavens like a scroll. Everything is available to those who have discovered the sensitivity uh, of great creative value. And I think each one of us should try to hold on to this value, which is this value, which is the experience of the creativity of beauty. And we gain it little by little through simple means. But finally, as it matures within ourselves, we move from the mere appreciation of fine things to the embodiment of fineness, so that all good things uh, move through us. Uh, to their own fulfillment without being detoured by some blank area in our own appreciation. I think that this type of thing is of the greatest value. It is hard to talk about, but it is more conveniently experienced than described. And anyone who takes hold upon value anywhere and holds to it tightly and allows it to lead him will come in the end to this kind of mystical experience uh, which makes life a very much more rich and wonderful span of years and makes every life, no matter how humble in its common circumstances, makes every life a great life, an important life, and a creative life. Well, I guess time is up, so we'll have to end this ramblings and we'll ramble on again next week. Thank you very much.